Şimdi konuklarımız birazdan Merkez Bankası Başkanları paneline geçeceğiz. Panelin moderatörlüğü için finansal istikrar, büyüme ve para politikaları konulu Merkez Bankası Başkanları panelin moderatörlüğü için Merkez Bankası Başkanımız Sayın Erdem Başçı'yı sahneye davet ediyorum. Buyurunuz lütfen. Konuklarımız Sahçek Cumhuriyeti Merkez Bankası Yönetim Kurulu Üyesi Sayın Kamil Yanaçek ve Polonya Merkez Bankası Yönetim Kurulu Üyesi Sayın Katarzyna Zarzel Krovska. Finansal istikrar, büyüme ve para politikaları konulu panel başlıyor. Buyurunuz lütfen. Biraz konuklarımız için hayatı kolaylaştırmak için e, müsaadenizle çok kısa konuşacağım. İngilizce konuşayım. E, let, let me speak English to make life easy, easy for you. Okay, thanks. Uh, <laughs> so most of the audience uh, does not need any translation. So I will just do uh, timekeeping uh, and uh, we have ample time. Uh, Dr. Zeti had to had to leave uh, early to catch a plane. So we can we can share the remaining uh, time among the two speakers. So, uh, according to let me see, according to the list that I have, uh, Kamil uh, Janacek yeah, uh, will, will, will be the first speaker. Uh, he's he's a board member uh, in the Czech National National Bank. The Czech National Bank has been quite uh, innovative and effective, I should say, regarding transparency, especially, yeah. and uh, inflation reports are very rich. And we also benefit actually from from their uh, from their reports. They have been uh, so transparent that they are even uh, producing the exchange rate forecasts, which are which yeah. are which are behind the inflation forecasts, and also scenario analysis yeah. based on the exchange rates in addition to the interest rates. So maybe uh, we can also benefit from you regarding regarding the Federal Reserve's exits and uh, implications. Yeah. Uh, to the Czech Republic. The, the floor Thank is yours. You. You, can, you can either use the podium. I prepare or... my. I have my. Yeah. Presentation. If you want, you can use the podium. Thank you. The floor is yours. Prepare my presentation, but I I see it's not. Not prepared here, so that let me to let me to share some experience with you on the financial stability uh, and monetary inflation targeting in the small open economy. Sorry, um, should we should we ask help from the organizers for for the presentation? Arkadaşlar, sunum bilgisayara yüklenmedi mi? Efendim? Verilmemiş. They, they, they don't have the presentation, so. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. I must, I must start with it. the prevailing views on monetary policy making reflect the experience of the fact that other central banks is major advanced economies. And the theoretical framework of flexible inflation targeting is strongly influenced by US academia. On the other hand, Central bankers in small and emerging economies, being both event, event takers or price takers, often do not have a chance to opt for the first best policies owing to external conditions set by macroeconomic policies of my major advanced economies. It is extremely true in European Union. Don't forget that Czech Republic is a member of the European Union. Must therefore The monetary policy must therefore be less orthodox, more flexible, and exceptionally smart 
to succeed. The optimal way of making monetary policy uh, may vary over time as external conditions and macroeconomic policies in large economies change, and there are also the external shocks, and occasionally steps that look intuitively may constitute the best reaction, though still being, I'm not talking as a theoretical research fellow, only second best. So, Czech economy in the last decade benefited from the flourishing external demand, shifting growth rates occasionally above longer term potential. In the mid of the last decade, we were highly over longer term potential. Solid economic growth was accompanied by low inflation environment with stable low rates. We ran in many years of the last decades, the second lowest rates after Switzerland. So that it was. <clears throat> so in this, from this respect, the Czech economy provides lessons how the expansionary effects of low short-term interest rates could be curtailed by the effects of nominal appreciation of the currency. So. My preliminary conclusion is that in a booming economy, currency appreciation can contribute to maintaining financial stability. Until the outbreak of uh, financial crisis, uh, till 2009, the Czech currency in the last 12 years appreciated, sustainably appreciated by uh, er, roughly 4% yearly against the euro and slightly more against the USD, so let's say. Or. The appreciation was stable, so I can only tell you that we started in uh, 98 with the exchange rate towards one euro at 39 crown, and now we are slightly under uh, 26, you, you can see. And moreover, having in mind that the share of visible export and imports represent 145% of nominal GDP, we are the third most, most open economy among the 28 European Union members. The exporters were able, let's say, to sustain this appreciation. So, we used only in, in, this, in, in this time once in 2002 the currency intervention when the Czech crown appreciated in, in six months by 14 percent so that we were forced to intervene and then from, the, uh, for, from 2002 uh, of course we, we have the regime of free float so, and we let, we let the currency free, uh, free flow without any direct or indirect intervention. As a, uh, but it, as a consequence of the appreciation pressure, Czech inflation often undershot the inflation target. We had till uh, 2010 the inflation target of 3% plus minus 1%. Now, from, uh, from the January 2011, we have inflation target of 2%. So, but uh, the credibility on inflation target is rather high, so that undershooting or slight overshooting the target, never mind. We only overshooted the target in 2008, when the, in, uh, the end of year inflation was 7%, but it was due to the severe ex hike, not due to monetary conditions. So that it, the inflation came back to 2% after one year. So, and as I mentioned earlier, from the uh, CNB rates, 
was for a long, for, for very long periods below the ECB level. What's the case now? The ECB uh, rate is 0 0.5. We are, we from uh, November 2nd last year, we hit the technical, technical zero rate. We have the repo rate at 0.05%. So we have no space for quantitative easing. Also due to the ample liquidity in the Czech banking sector. The Czech banks are parking overnight each day the sum in crowns uh, represented in, I, I, I, must, I must recalculate it to euros, between five to eight billion euros. So that it is ample liquidity in the Czech banking sector. We have no need, no need to support the economy and the growth by liquidity, unlike ECB, Fed, and the other, other central banks. So, it is due to the fact, and now the fin to, to financial stability, is due to the fact the banking system at the end of the 90s, or the second half of the 90s, was restructured, rehabilitated, and lesson learned from small financial crisis in 97, led to formation for a strong macroprudential mandate of the Czech National Bank. The act of uh, CNB defines financial stability as one of the CNB's key objectives, and from this year in the law, the macroprudential policy is on the same level as monetary policy, so at the same level as inflation targeting. And despite the strong impact of global financial crisis on the Czech economy. The, the finance sector proved its resilience and even increased profitability in the last several years. It, is, it was a really strange situation that all parts of economy, other non-financial companies decreased profitability, but financial co companies increased profitability. What? Perhaps it's also due to the fact that unlike other countries, uh, Czech National Bank from 2005 is responsible for regulation and supervision of all financial institutions in the country. I, am, as I must admit, of course, there are pros and cons. You can read it in academic journals. You can hear uh, the experience of other colleagues but I must admit that it's a big advantage for macroprudential policy and keeping financial stability when you, when you have all, also other instruments in your hand than instruments of monetary policy. Now back to the appreciation of the currency. In a booming economy, the Czech case proved that currency appreciation can contribute to financial stability, especially via reducing risk-taking through a favorable nominal illusion. It may work against overly optimistic expectation in the corporate sector to tame the credit-enabled excessive investment in boom period. As I, as I have uh, mentioned, uh, more than half of the Czech uh, manufacturing is exporting. The share of manufacturing, uh, uh, the share on GDP, on formation, on value added of GDP, is more than 30 percent. We, with Germany, we are we have the highest share of manufacturing on GDP. So, it could shift part, and it proved in the past, of domestic demand from non-tradables to tradables. It could decrease the growth rate of nominal income and thus restrict over-optimism regarding future trends and future growth in loan demand. Uh, under such illusion, uh, households will compare low interest rates with slow growth in nominal income, and of course, it's another advantage, the households are taking loans exclusively in domestic currency. 
unlike the situation in Hungary, where the, loans, the household loans in foreign currency exceeds 70 percent, the share of the share of uh, foreign loans in household portfolio is 0.1 percent. It's nil. And yeah, but I think it's, it's yeah. So. As uh, economic theory tell us that sustained currency appreciation should create uh, an incentive for household to borrow in a currency that is becoming cheaper over time, but cheaper currency over time due to the fact that, the, that there are the low interest rates in the Czech low interest rates uh, let's do uh, led to loans in local currency. Even the corporates changed the foreign loans in the last decade from foreign, uh, foreign loans to domestic loans, the share at, at the beginning of the last, of the, at the beginning of the, uh, in 2002, the share of loans to corporate sector in foreign currencies was over 20%, now it's 9%. And the majority of loans are export or import loans, of course. So, now we are neck to the wall with uh, interest rate, this repo rate. So, what can we do? The exchange, we, we declared very clearly several times a readiness to intervene. The market knows, knows that we are prepared to intervene let's say, to depreciate the Czech currency and indirectly to help the exports, to help the exports in the condition of anemic growing European economy. Unlike the authorities in countries with fixed exchange rate or in currency unions, as are two countries of Baltics, may resort to monetary policy measure other than policy rates and intervention, uh, we, can, we can use other standard and perhaps also non-standard measures. You know that the story of, the, of some countries in the area shows that having neither autonomous monetary policy, not rational macroprudential policy is dangerous. There are some speakers earlier in the morning speaking about this part of Eurozone and Europe. And I see not only my stance, but the, I see the stance, official stance of Czech National Bank. The, in, the, in the situation we are living in, we are living in European Union as a, as a close, uh, as, uh, having 81% exports towards Euro European Union or Euro economic era and 60% of the exports toward European countries of European Monetary Union. We know there is no room for one size fits all models. We must adapt. We must adapt our policy according to the new situation, be prepared for external shocks and so on. So it's preliminary. There are the preliminary results of our experience from the past five or ten years. So now we knew if economy starts undergoing a dynamic drive again, perhaps in two years, accompanied by credit and asset price booms, we know that the authorities should apply a concerted set of microprudential and macroprudential measures to tame excess optimism and mitigate its potential consequences. Factors mitigating procyclicality embodied in some regulations measures may ensure a build-up of buffers 
But in the first place, tougher supervision should prevent bankers from taking undue risk. We forced, uh, in the first year after Lehman's brother collapse, our banks not to report on monthly basis, but to report on weekly basis, and it proved to be very sensible on both sides. Monetary policy makers might need to step in directly using various credit-related channels. You know that the central bank has the central bank has this instrument in its hands. But still, in the economies we are responsible for, plenty of wisdom, courage, communication skill, and in the first pay luck will be needed to succeed. Now, let me to conclude with four questions. Could we really, could we really exchange rate uses as a tool to strengthen financial stability? How to combine achievement of the inflation targeting with the fight against bubbles? Was the rationale behind Czech crown appreciation? Was the CNB just lucky? Or was, was it clever? Was it clever policy in the past? Could be exchange rate used in the symmetric situation in the fight against recession? As an arrogant macroeconomist, I surely would say, yes, we know it was clever policy, and yes. But as a humble central banker, I must admit that this, this question mark are still question mark for all of us. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Janacek. This was a very uh, rich presentation. So sorry, yeah. sorry for, for the staff be, making it available a bit late, but uh, the presentation itself is very rich. Mm -hmm. And the Czech example is also very interesting. Uh, mm -hmm. If you have time, maybe we can, we can also discuss yeah. a little bit. Uh, it's very interesting because you are now on the zero lower bound camp. Yeah. It's 0.1 percent, and still the currency is appreciating. Yeah. So, so that's uh, that's very very I interesting. Think case. It's, uh, it's the unique situation with the ample liquidity in the yes. banking sector. So yes. That so it's uh, a combination of two factors. Yes. You cannot find it around. So yes. But so maybe maybe Poland is is a candidate for that because I see that now the Poland uh, is also National Bank of Poland is also cutting the interest rates mm -hmm. in face of uh, below target inflation and perhaps uh, strong strong currency but we should hear uh, from our guest speaker uh, Katarina Zajder uh, Kroska if that's correct pronunciation. Yes, that's correct. Uh, Thank you. The floor is yours please. Thank you. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, so let me first thank the organizers for inviting me for this, uh, for this summit. This is a big pleasure to be here and to share with you experience uh, from Poland, how we dealt with uh, the financial crisis, uh, uh, how we conduct monetary policy in that uh, very uh, challenging period, uh, and given that we are meeting in the moment when the Fed makes decision about what will happen next, I think that this is very important to, to talk about uh, challenges for the monetary policy that is the anchor for the, for the stable growth uh, that we are discussing today. Well, I prepared the presentation uh, from very um, narrow um, uh, area, not to focus about the, the whole uh, bunch of the issues uh, in Poland. Uh, I will only mention that Poland uh, was the only one country uh, that avoided recession during the financial crisis. Uh, I w the only one country in the European Union, I should add, <laughs> yeah. because this is not the only one country in the world, in the European Union. So, uh, so um, uh, I will show you how, uh, how we managed that, how we, uh, what w were the reasons and, uh, and, the, and the factors that, that, uh, that um, anchored Polish economy and uh, gave some, some uh, um, area for, for, for brief. Well, 
First, I would like to mention uh, about, uh, about uh, challenges to the monetary policies and, uh, and uh, uh, organizers ask us to, uh, to, um, to give the answer to the question what the central banks can, how the central banks act in the case of escalation of the global risk. It means that we still are, uh, are afraid of the global risks to es escalate uh, and uh, I think that it makes a lot of sense to discuss what, will, what we as the central banks can do going forward. So first I would like to show you very, very uh, interesting two charts. It's about uh, loose monetary policies in advanced economies that contributed to the huge capital inflow to emerging uh, economies, including Poland, uh, Turkey, uh, was also the example of, of, of huge uh, inflow of, of capital. And it, of course, resulted, uh, resulted first to the appreciation, strong appreciation of the currency, and of course, huge inflow uh, to, the, to, the, to the sovereign debt market that resulted in, uh, in uh, um, uh, narrowing of the CDS spreads and also to the to the lowering of the yields uh, at the uh, at the sovereign debt market. Of course, we were very happy about that. But then, um, Fed made announcement, or the market started speculating about some changes and shifts in the monetary policies in advanced countries, and it had very very strong implication on uh, on the uh, currencies. Uh, I will show you here about the uh, currencies and, and of course bond markets across the board. Here, here you can see that Paul is not relatively resilient to the, to the announcement about QE tapering, uh, while other countries, including uh, uh, Lira, uh, uh, uh, lost uh, a lot. And in our opinion, um, the part of the reason Behind, behind the story was that, uh, that the higher, the higher in, uh, external imbalance the country has, the higher risk of, of the, uh, or the country is the most exposed to the capital inflow, outflow. Particularly that, uh, that uh, during the period of this ample uh, global liqu liquidity, um, the, the monetary policy and, and the, the, the generally the emerging markets economies uh, became a policy taker. So it was difficult to conduct independent uh, mon particular monetary policies because we absorbed all uh, consequences of monetary policies uh, from advanced countries. However, the first lesson to us uh, was, of course, the, the, um, the current account position and not only the, the size of the current account deficit, but also how this deficit is financed. The second uh, is about the exchange rate, uh, that Polish lot is fully floating currencies, not, we are not the member of the Eurozone. So this is another, uh, another um, reason that w uh, the, the exchange could easily absorb shocks from abroad going up or down, and, uh, and um, this gave more, more um, area, um, more uh, flexibility to monetary policies, and, uh, and it also supported uh, financial stability. Given that Zloty proved relatively resilient to all those shocks, uh, the CPI remained very low, even below the, the accepted uh, level for the central bank, and also what is very important, according to our studies, the inflation's expectations are also well anchored. So uh, I mentioned fundamentals, so, so current account, but, uh, but also what is very important, particularly when you deal with the sharp outflow of hot money or the speculative capital that, that we've noticed uh, in recent months, is the capital backstop that the country has. Um, one of this is, of course, uh, the foreign reserves. Poland um, uh, has huge foreign reserves. We are the 23rd country uh, in, the, in the world with the highest official reserves, more than $100 billion. And what's even more, they fully finance uh, short-term debt 
so from that reason, Poland is resilient and is, is uh, stable. What's even important is that, that, uh, that, uh, that uh, we have also signed the uh, arrangement with the uh, IMF for the flexible credit line. So the country has access to 34 billion US dollar of the flexible line if needed. This is the very last resort, of course, but it also gives some space for the country uh, in, the, in the situation if, there, if, there, if we witness a, a, a adverb uh, uh, shock. So it's extremely important. What is also very important in case of Poland is that we accumulated those reserves not by buying just simple currencies or we, have any, we had any strategy for the build-up of reserves. Poland um, was uh, a, a large re the recipient of large EU structural funds. Uh, since Poland joined the European Union, we managed and we learned how to, how to spend EU structural money. And this was also the number third lesson that we took from the crisis that we could, uh, we could spend those money for the public investment. So in the other countries where they, they were forced to, to, to find the fiscal space and they had to consolidate, we could expand because we received a lot of money from the EU and it also uh, supported the, the growth. During that period, as I mentioned, uh, monetary policy remained quite challenging. So the central bank implemented flexible approach to the, uh, to the inflation targeting uh, by making some, some uh, innovations, we can say. Um, very rarely, central bank intervened uh, in the um, exchange rate markets just to to, uh, to avoid the rapid volatility at the market. Also, um, we, um, we uh, cut, as the governor said, we cut aggressively interest rates to the level of around 2%. Uh, however, which was the, the latest innovation, the central bank implemented the forward guidance uh, and said just to give some stability or credibility uh, for future uh, and mentioned that will not change the interest rates definitely by the end or till the end of the year. So this is also very important for the investors in real economy and also portfolio investors. What would be the, the level of the interest rates going forward? Of course, there are plenty of, of risks. We are aware of those risks, but this is very important. Uh, on top of that, we also um, we are working very, um, very uh, intensively about uh, uh, establishing the macro prudential risk board. Um, uh, we have a lot of instruments and measures already implemented that are conducted by the supervisory uh, authority. Uh, but there will be uh, more, and also during the crisis, we very closely monitored the, um, the trend of the, of the mortgage uh, credits, particularly those mortgage credits financed by the FX. Currently, it is completely forbidden. Those FX loans have been banned, and, uh, and it is not possible to take loan in Poland that are in, um, in the foreign currency. And this is extremely important because uh, that huge share of the FX lending uh, add more volatility to the exchange, exchange market, particularly when the currency started the depreciating. So to sum up uh, my presentation is uh, what the central banks can do uh, when the, when the, uh, the risk um, appear and uh, first of all we should assure strong fundamentals so the policy should be well balanced both fiscal and monetary policies and uh, of course we can we can uh, pursue flexible inflation targeting uh, that will contribute to macroeconomic stability um, we should we should promote macroprudential measures that should also capture some internal imbalances. 
we can we can somehow monitor and play with the exchange rate saying that we should avoid strong volatility of the currencies so central bank should be very active uh, in terms of monitoring what's going on at the exchange market and from time to time act if necessary. Um, and in the end, as, as I mentioned, uh, should be predictable in that sense, like Poland, that we uh, implemented this, this uh, forward guidance saying what we will do uh, in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, we have just a few minutes uh, on the scheduled program. So if there are uh, one or two questions, we could take them from the audience, if that's okay with you. Uh, should we take questions? Is, uh, are, are you, are you re prepared for that? Okay. Okay. So if there are any. Yes, the presentations were very clear. I have, I have the impression that this, uh, this should be tested, this should be studied uh, by academics and econometricians, but the impression from, from the two presentations and what we observe in the world uh, elsewhere uh, is that emerging markets in fact are much more resilient than uh, they sometimes are uh, assumed to be. We heard the Malaysian governor, Dr. Zetis, presentation uh, in Asia, it's very flexible, so they can very quickly adapt to the new environment. And also the same in the Eastern Europe. Uh, that's what we observe. But the observation that I would like to share with you, maybe I should hear, hear your comments uh, about that, especially the Czech Republic, but also uh, Polish uh, view. If you use the interest rate uh, as an instrument against the exchange rate appreciations or depreciations, something that the Czech Republic has, has done very systematically, very regularly, by citing exchange rate developments and cutting, actually, the interest rates to avoid appreciation of the currency, or the opposite. For instance, th think of the Indonesian example. Recently, Indonesia is under pressure of depreciation, but they hike to stop the uh, depreciation of the currency. In either case, it turns out, you are not able to do it. You are, you are not able to stop the appreciation by cutting the interest rates. You are not able to stop the depreciation by hiking the interest rates. So perhaps a strategy would be just to focus on inflation targeting, as Katerina has pointed out, flexible in inflation targeting, and just focus on the medium-term inflation and just adjust the interest rate accordingly. And just don't care about the exchange rate. Probably that could be more, more stabilizing regarding the currency. What are your views about that? Uh, if you start uh, with uh, maybe Katerina. Would you, would you like to start? Yeah, of course, both. It's your lady first. Well, f f thank you. Uh, well, uh, I, I fully agree that, this, um, that, there, are, uh, that there is uh, like uh, difficult to, to, uh, to control exchange rate if you have uh, only one target, which is inflation. And in Poland, the same as in Czech, we, we, uh, the monetary policy is, is focused only on the price stability. Uh, however, the exchange rate is extremely important because depending on the, what's going on on the exchange market, uh, the central bank should, should uh, react accordingly. But it's ex extremely difficult or challenging in the period when there is a huge uh, st uh, storm uh, abroad and, uh, you, uh, and it's difficult to, to, to, to gauge whether this is, this is made because uh, this, this, this, this, uh, this uh, volatility on the exchange market is made because, because there is the, the inflow of the hot money or this is the, the, the, the inflow of, for example, of the EU structural money, which is the long term. So it's very difficult. So that's why we do not, uh, we do not um, intervene in the, uh, in the FX market, uh, we, uh, we uh, adopted the strategy that, uh, that, uh, that uh, we like our flexible exchange rate and we do not care if this goes up or, or, or, or it goes down. However, the central bank, as I mentioned in my presentation, should be, should be active observer, maybe not player, but active observer uh, what's going on uh, in the exchange, exchange rate market because the rapid depreciation or the, or the rapid appreciation may 
may, be very, may have very um, uh, negative spillovers to the real economy, uh, particularly in the area that I mentioned, FX loans uh, uh, that, uh, that uh, co co contributed to the, to the uh, large por portfolio of, of, uh, of mortgage loans in Poland. Uh, so it may have even political implications because if the slot depreciates heavily to the Swiss franc and the majority of mortgage, uh, uh, mortgage loans are, are denominated in the Swiss francs, then the, the, the population or the, the households will claim that the, that the politicians should do something with exchange rate because they will have to pay higher mortgage rates. So definitely, we as a central bank, we are not we are not like uh, we are not controlling the exchange rate we are not intervening in the sense that we would like to set a certain level we would like to only avoid very uh, large volatility however the key target and the key priori priority for the central bank is the price stability can i think this in principle the same price for the uh, check case so in the past, we only intervened against the appreciation. We, had, we have no experience <laughs> with, the, uh, with the intervention, no practical experience. We know theoretically how to do it, of course. So, but nevertheless, I must stress once more that to the volatility of the Czech currency was uh, very low in comparison with other emerging markets or his, our, in, even in comparison with some of our neighbors. But we were very happy in 2009 when that, uh, unlike Poland, the Czech economy experienced a recession of almost 4% drop in GDP, having in mind that the foreign demand dropped. And we let, uh, as a consequence, we let the Czech currency depreciate by 8% in principle. And according to our, uh, to our estimates, it's, you can read it in our quarterly inflation reports, uh, between 60 to 65% of losses, of potential losses of exporters were covered by, by, by this depreciation. They lost, of course, some uh, uh, so some business abroad, but they gain in crowns in Czech currency more. But now we are facing uh, the new situation, but we are continuing, as you very generously, Mr. Governor, you mentioned, you are continuing with our very transparent policy that we uh, all seven members of the board told several times, and officially Governor Singer after each monetary session that we are really prepared to intervene when the situation would be back to recession in the Czech economy and so on, or close to uh, deflation and so on. And we are, and I must admit, I am prepared to intervene even among the, the normal monetary session of the board. We are prepared to do it from one day to another. The market, the, mar the, the market know, know it, so that and we are transparent in it, and it's not a game. It's not it's not the game with the market. It's our perception. So uh, please please join me to thank the speakers. Uh, and please pass my regards to Governor Belka and Governor Zinger. Thank you. Değerli misafirlerimiz, panelistlerimize plaketlerini vermek üzere eski Merkez Bankası Başkanımız Durmuş Yılmaz'ı ve Cumhurbaşkanı Başkanımız Danışmanımız Durmuş Yılmaz'ı sahneye davet ediyorum. Buyurunuz lütfen.
Sayın panelistlerimize teşekkürlerimizi sunuyoruz. Elbette moderatörümüz Sayın Erdem Başçı'ya da.